about the last model I made that has taken the water. This is this cutter. It's based upon a typical Royal Naval cutter of about 1800. And I use the hull lines of HMS Alert, as these are pretty standard. But the full boiler work are from a later model. And the rig is probably about 1810. The original alert rig is ugly and looks like a badly arranged washing line. Whilst I wanted the rig to feature a square topsail, I was particularly interested to see how the rig could be controlled and how the model would perform under sail. As you can see, the rig is enormous and it's also on a very short length hull compared to its width. This is likely to make it hard to maintain directional stability. And I've always doubted the practicality of the square topsail as depicted on models, because it's shown with these spreaders here. Effectively, these prevent the square saw yard being braced around more than a very small amount. This seems a little advantage to having a having square rig for all the extra top weight and complication. In practice, I don't accept this and to allow the yards to be braced, I simply unlock the stays from the spreader arm. That shows how it can be operated. There must have been a way of doing that on the original ships, but I don't know what it was. This is your typical scale drawing showing the rig of the boat. The main thing to note about that, apart from the fact the sheer size of it, is the fact that the topsail yard is more or less close down towards the cap and it is nowhere near the full height of the whole sail. Normally the distance between the lower yard and the cap is half the total height of the sail. This shows the uh, model on the building board shows the frames, ply frames, and you can see that the keel and stem and stern posts are in, slotted into place. And you can also see that part of the carvel planking is in place. That will be the first plank you see there of carvel is in fact the whale. I built the carvel planking in at that point to support the stern works, which otherwise would have been sort of floating free with nothing to hold them in place. But it caused a problem later. This shows the thinker planking in progress. You can see a couple of strakes down there on the table shaped to presumably be the next things to fit in place. Um, you obviously build with matching strakes. You make two strakes at a time, one for each side. And you fit them at the same time. The left hand photograph shows the point where I came where I decided I had a real problem and the problem was that the clinker planking which is only a sixteenth of an inch thick where it meets the carvel gives you a sixteenth inch thick butt joint and I didn't think that was at all safe on a working model sailing model and because of the way I built the thing with the formers, it would have been very difficult indeed to try and reinforce that particular joint. So I decided to get around it by turning the clinker back into carvel. And so on the left hand side of that photograph, you see that the, the clinker has been filled with car body filler, which has then been rubbed down. I've left the right hand side for the moment showing the clinker to show what it was like before. The right hand photograph is just the same thing, but from a different angle. This shows the model taken off the building board. It has still got two of the building frames complete. The idea being that when necessary, I can turn the boat back and upside down to put it back on the building board to do anything I need to do underneath with a bottle held firmly in place. One of the things I needed to do, for example, was fit a rudder. 
the lower photograph you can start you can see where i'm starting to fit in the radio control you can see a winch there and a rudder servo and i don't think i've made much progress there but the inside of that has been painted out with epoxy resin it's my practice to rip out quite a lot of the ply ribs if i can on these models they're usually over engineered in this case i've reduced them down a bit and you can see i've also started putting in deck beams the left hand model shows you that i have now fitted the rudder and the sub deck is in place and that is made of six inch ply which i put on in sections so that allows for shear and camber and you can see there are some whopping great access hatches there i've learnt my lesson where i've got winches with lines running in all directions underneath i want to have access so that i can rerun broken lines or deal with problems you can see in the right hand picture that through that hatch you can see there are a couple of lines running forward and the at the very front of the bow there on the deck you can see a slot and that is where there are a couple of brass sheaves below to take winch lines these are two more deck shots you can see on the left hand one we've now got uh, deck planking laid on top of the ply sub deck the ply sub deck is bedded down on epoxy so the in theory the inside of the hull is more or less all coated with with epoxy but the the deck here which is lime planking is simply glued down with evo stick or some rather um anyway, an ordinary waterproof glue you can see some of the details here you can see where winch lines are coming out of the side of the hull there are only temporary lines there just to pick, be picked up later this is a stage further it shows spars being put into place you can see the bowsprit is now in place as i've mentioned before this is a reefing bowsprit and that can be pulled right back on well on the ship itself or on board but i pull it back till it's about just clear of the bow so it doesn't foul the bow end irons and things if you look at the bow sprit you can see the flanking timbers there have got holes drilled through them this is where you put through some sort of a fid to hold it in place i just use a matchstick there's a good reason to use a matchstick if the boat plows into the bank of the pond the usual result is it just shears through the matchstick and the bow sprit retracts onto the boat without anything anything coming to any harm you can see if you look at the rudder that apart from the scale rudder you've also got a clip-on addition that was my first attempt as a sailing rudder it's nowhere near big enough i'm now on my third edition at the minute this shows the rig pretty well complete but without sails you can see the spreaders there and you can see with the top mast stays in place that lower yard there can only swing around quite a small amount before it fouls it one thing you can see from this is that the yard braces square yard braces they come out of the boat from the winch in the bow they go right out to the bowsprit end through a block there and then back up to the yards at the ends they don't necessarily in this case i think they go to the yard ends but in practice they get adjusted to tune the tune how the rear sails work there you can see it with sails the main thing you might notice from this particular shot is that the topsail square sheet is cut very high it's got a very high roach very high cut foot being necessary to make sure i cleared the spreaders the right hand photo there shows the four stay sill and if you look at it you can see that it's got a bit of bamboo or something laced to the foot of the sail this is because that particular sail is not radio controlled it's not on a winch and so it's left cell tacking 
and having that small boom on it helps it to self-tack. The jib there, which is the left-hand sail, which just clears the forestay, if you follow it down, you can see a faint line, which I think is monofilament, going back and then going through a hole in the side of the boat. This shows the radio control system used. It's got a very, very powerful winch, which has a pull of about 12 pounds. And I run the winch lines in a continuous loop through a couple of brass sheaves way up near the front of the bow. I get the two as far apart as possible, so I can get the maximum pull in, take out, whatever, on the winch. The winch itself has a double drum. And, but I always extend the flanges of these winches to stop line jump because I've had lines, they often get slack in no matter how tightly you've set them up. They often get slack in, so I extend the flanges so that in theory at least, a line can't just flop over the side onto the wrong drum and jam the whole works up. The lines on the winch itself are always very fine braided fishing line, probably 30 pound braking strain, but at the halfway point along the main circuit there where other tappings are taken off, at that point I change it to a much thicker, heavier thread, which is of the right diameter to fit in the brass sheave slots, fit in it in the sense that it takes it entirely up same diameter as the as the cutter in the sheave so that it can't sort of work its way out over the edge of the sheave and jam the works up. The tappings off are generally speaking monofilament, 30 pound monofilament until the lines are outside the boat when I usually change them to the hemp line more in keeping with the normal sheeting. It's monofilament because monofilament slides easily. It doesn't readily get caught up on any snags under the deck. And it also doesn't twist. It has no laid effect at all in it. Basically, uh, that's about it regarding the RC system. This shows a couple of show photographs showing the model on the water. Pretty calm conditions at that point in time. And in spite of that, if you look at the right hand one, you'll see that there's not a heck of a lot of freeboard there. The gun ports are above deck level, not by a lot, but they certainly are. And so you've, uh, you're very nearly at deck level on the um, leeward side of the boat there in the water. So it wouldn't take much more to have water pouring through the gun ports. That's as far as I can go. Thank you very much.